please subscribe and don't forget to press the bell icon to get notified whenever we upload a new video. Cabinet clears the way to introduce the Fugitive Economic Offenders Bill in Parliament. The bill aims to deter willful defaulters and alleged fraudsters from leaving the country. Offences of over 100 crore rupees under the purview of this bill. Cabinet also announced the creation of the National Financing Reporting Authority. Authority to act as an independent regulator for auditors. Finance Minister clarifies that the new body will supersede the Indian Chartered Accountants Association. No bail for Karthi Chidambaram just yet. A special court sends him to five more days in CBI custody. He's accused of taking bribes to influence a government decision when his father, P. Chidambaram, was the finance minister back in 2007. Wanted in India for an alleged fraud, Nirav Modi writes a fresh letter to Punjab National Bank, offers to settle dues with jewellery worth 2,000 crore rupees and current account deposits. Government moves to rationalise overseas operations of PSQ banks, 35 overseas branches and operations to be consolidated, 69 more branches identified for further examination. The Aviation Ministry readies a draft expression of interest for the Air India stake sale. A finance minister-led alternate mechanism group of ministers is likely to meet next week to chalk out details. That's an exclusive. And strong auto sales across categories in February. Bajaj Auto reports a 30% uptick. Royal Enfield sales keep Aisha thumping. Meanwhile, Escort sales too jump 52%, while Maruti reports an inline 15% growth. Good evening and thank you very much for joining us on India Business Hour. I'm Kritika Saxena and Ron Ajay Banerjee joins in now from the Delhi studio. Hi, Ron. Hi, Kritika. Well, with the economic offenders like Vijay Mali and Nirav Modi on the run, the government is now pushing for a new law which will tighten the noose on the absconders. And that, Kritika, is the top story we're tracking this evening. Absolutely, Ron. And uh, two weeks after the 12,700 crore rupee fraud came to light at Punjab National Bank, there have been rapid developments in the case. So, firstly, the cabinet has paved the way for the introduction of the Fugitive Economic Offenders Bill to be introduced in the second leg of the budget session. Now, the new bill essentially aims to avoid willful defaulters like Vijay Malia and, of course, alleged fraudsters like Nirav Modi from fleeing the country. The draft bill provides for confiscation of assets in cases without conviction in cases where economic offenders have fleed the country without paying the lender. Not just that, the cabinet has also announced the creation of a new regulating authority for auditors called the National Financing Reporting Authority. The finance minister made it very clear that this new body will not supersede the Indian Chartered Accountants Association in any way. Listen in to what the finance minister had to say. We will try and make sure that uh, uh, this is passed as expeditiously as possible because... Uh, we can't allow people to make a mockery of the law uh, uh, that you first indulge in loot and then uh, refuse to submit to the jurisdiction of uh, our legal system. And I, I think we have a very responsible parliament. It can't come to the aid of such people. It will certainly be doing something which is hostile to the interest of these people. This bill does not aim at getting the fugitive back with the cooperation. That's the extradition part. Yeah, but the confiscation of his property is abroad. The way this uh, bill works is that if you confiscate his property in India and abroad, then there are good chances that the fugitive will come, come back to India. Least, if you can't get that ma person here, then? get his property. Mm. So that is what this bill seeks to achieve and it will definitely put pressure and force the fugitive to come. NAFRA is A, not intended to replace the disciplinary jurisdiction of an Institute of Chartered Accountants. It's, that is not the intention. Yes, madam. Therefore, yes. therefore, for all the regular routine cases, uh, uh, which will be bulk of the cases with regard to uh, smaller businesses, I think the Institute of Chartered Accountants uh, will continue to perform its function. See, now, after the cabinet approval, 
we will be in a position to commence this uh, section 132, right, sir. Uh, which uh, uh, speaks about establishment of NAFRA. Right. So the National Financial uh, uh, Reporting Authority mm -hmm. will uh, will come into force mm -hmm. as soon as the uh, notification is issued and the underlying rules are notified, right. which should take about uh, a fortnight. Right. You know, one uh, you know thing which was curious for us was that a listed companies will be covered and be unlisted companies there will be a threshold now how does NFRA then get into a investigation or how does NFRA then start investigating these companies what will be the trigger you see uh, even now under the ICAI mm -hmm. under the Chartered Accountant Act you have a quality review board right they precisely do this same act activity of looking at the quality of financial reporting of firms mm -hmm. so when NAFRA is constituted and it has this constituency of listed companies and large unlisted companies, it can, through some sort of random sampling or some other uh, method, mm -hmm. decide which companies' uh, balance sheets and financial statements it wishes to, mm -hmm. uh, to uh, review. Well, that was one arrow in the government's quiver that they unveiled today as an attempt as a, and a way in which to fight defaulters fleeing the country. Meanwhile, our correspondent Ritu Singh caught up with senior advocate Sanjay Hegre and corporate lawyer H.P. Ranina on this very specific issue, and this is what they made of this bill. Take a look. What is the big difference in, you know, this new law that is being proposed, this bill that is being proposed, as opposed to what we already had under PMLA to deal with these issues? The new uh, provision is to allow uh, confiscation of properties hmm. of these willful offenders and defaulters even before the conviction is done by a competent court. Today the problem in India is that the courts take a very long time to come to a decision and to convict an offender. So now they say that once uh, the special court is of the prime official opinion that he's a willful defaulter, Mm. and he's absconding, then his properties in India can be confiscated. Because the main issue is that, you know, waiting for people to come here, they never, they, they blatantly defy Indian court orders, mm. as other as Vijay and others have done. So there is no point in, you know, waiting for their extradition because, you know, foreign courts take a lot of time, as we have seen recently. Therefore, they say, forget the person, where they come, where doesn't come, we will simply confiscate whatever properties he has in India. We'll attach them, and then with the order of the special court, we will, uh, you know, confiscate them and sell off the properties and pay off the uh, creditors. All right. Uh, Mr. Renena, do stay on with us. Mr. Sanjay Hegre also joining us here on the show. Mr. Hegre, what do you make of the Fugitive uh, Economic Offenders Bill from the draft law that we've already seen? Of course, we're yet to see what changes are made to that law. Uh, but what do you make of this bill? Well, Mr. Renena has more or less accurately captured any individual against whom a warrant for arrest in relation to a scheduled offence has been issued by any court in India who has who leaves India or has left India or refuses to return to India. Hmm. Now, in the schedule, there are a whole host of offences under the IPC and under other uh, special enactments, uh, including Customs, SEBI, uh, Prevention of Corruption, Companies Act, and Insolvency and Bankruptcy Court. So what it, this effectively means is that if you skip Indian courts or you, skip, mm. uh, you go out of India to avoid pro uh, proceedings mm. and say uh, let whatever happens, uh, let it happen, then uh, the uh, prosecution agencies are no longer obliged to wait for any formal conviction, mm. for wait, uh, wait to go under the ordinary law to declare somebody a, a proclaimed offender and then seizes uh, assets. Instead, they can proceed under this act the moment a warrant, uh, warrant of arrest has been issued and that mm. warrant has been avoided by going abroad. There is a time period of 180 days given within which, uh, you know, the crime has to be proven. Otherwise, again, you know, uh, you know, how do we read this? After that 180 days, are those properties, I mean, will uh, the case fall after that if not proven? Then it again comes back to how PMLA worked earlier. Yes, if they are not able to prove the conviction or the, the, the commitment of the offence, then obviously that provisional attachment will cease. And that is obviously done because otherwise, you know, this law may be declared unconstitutional by the Supreme Court. 
Mr. Hegri, again, I wanted your views on the same. I mean, uh, you know, back to this question, even the PMLA provided for confiscation of property, uh, you know, provisional attachment until the crime was proven. Similarly here also we have the case of 180 days being given to prove the crime, otherwise it falls through. Uh, so what is really the need for this new bill? I mean, couldn't an amendment have been made perhaps in the PMLA to ensure that uh, cases that are being handled under different jurisdictions can now be handled by this special court? Even ordinary offences like IPC, hmm. uh, where, where uh, an ordinary offence like cheating, supposing I cheat somebody, hmm. and um, like cheat, uh, like many of these Ponzi schemes, and and then skip off with the uh, 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 abroad, hmm. then the uh, if there is a warrant of arrest issued, hmm. then whatever property that remains in India, if it is the proceeds of a crime, then irrespective of whether if the property stands in the name of the offender or not, that also can be confiscated under this act. Hmm. Mr. Hegri? Yeah, of course, the offender's own property is anyway liable to be confiscated. Yes. But what I, what I see in the draft is that supposing the offender has, has passed the proceeds of the crime in property, uh, either through a company or or or, uh, or in some other benami manner or in the name of close relatives, even that property is liable to be seized and confiscated. In fact, Ritu Singh also caught up with Vishesh Chandiyog, the national managing partner at Grand Thornton India, to discuss the formation of a new regulator to oversee auditors. NFRA, or NAFRA as the finance minister calls it. She began by asking him about his first reaction to the government's decision. Here's an excerpt of that exclusive interview. Yeah, I think a very welcome move, uh, a move uh, that was long overdue because the NFRA was actually proposed under the Companies Act 2013, which, as you know, you know became effective from 1st of April 2014. So, uh, you know, it's something that's been legislated for a while. Uh, and therefore, a very welcome move that has finally been uh, you know, uh, expedited and uh, given life to. What are the roles the NFRA will play? Uh, basically, uh, four, four roles, I think. You know, first of all, setting accounting standards, which under the old Companies Act was done by uh, a body called NACAS under the Ministry of Corporate Affairs. The second is setting auditing standards, which earlier was done by the Institute of Chartered Accountants. The third is looking at the... Uh, firm level quality control and engagement quality control, uh, so individual audits that firms perform, yeah. which was earlier done by the QRB of the ICAI. Mm. And lastly, the you know, a disciplinary mechanism, so when somebody does not perform uh, audits or maintain quality control in line with you know, the quality control standard one, then you know what disciplinary action can you bring against individual auditors or audit firms? Hmm. So those are the those are the four roles uh, under NFRA. The Institute of Chartered Accountants of India, or ICAI, perhaps not so happy with this. You know, wouldn't you think with the overarching regulations that NAFRA will now have, uh, the ICAI's role becomes slightly more redundant? I think uh, you know, the ICAI done a terrific job promoting high standards within the profession, setting high standards, uh, both for qualification as well as performance. Mm. But any profession which is seen to be self-regulated yeah. is simply not seen to be independent anymore. And as I said, you know, I, 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 the water's already passed that uh, bridge and we need to accept current reality. The recent events only show that there is immense need to build trust and confidence in the business of audit. Yeah. And that can only happen if there is a body that is seen to be truly independent. You mm. know, for example, the current body, the QRB, yeah. is not seen to be independent and we're the only major economy in the world where that regulator, the QRB of the IC, you know, which is, you know, quasi-ICAI, quasi-government, is not a member of the global forum called the ICR, which mm. is the independent forum of uh, or International Forum of Independent Audit Regulators. We're the only major economy, right? Mm. The PCAOB, FRC, mm. all the other similar regulators are members. And the reason for that is because, the, you know, the QRB is funded by the Institute and housed in the Institute. Mm. And 50% of its members come from the Institute. So, if, you know, I, there's too much control of the profession over that body. At the end of the day, you know, the 101 in our profession is, are you seen to be independent um, or are you seen to be uh, you're not as independent as you could be?
And I think that's what uh, will happen. Well, those were some of the important decisions taken by the cabinet today. So, let, but let's now get you the latest in the PNB fraud case. The crackdown by agencies in the PNB fraud case continues unabated. The Enforcement Directorate has now attached 31, 41 properties, correction, belonging to Mehul Choksi under the PMLA. These properties are valued at over 1,200 crore rupees. The attached properties include 15 flats and 17 office premises in the city of Mumbai, a mall in Kolkata, a four-acre farmhouse in Alibagh, and 231 acres of land at various other locations. Separately, we also learned that Nirav Modi has been writing to officials using a virtual private network or VPN in order to hide his exact location. Amidst all this, Nirav Modi has now written a letter, a fresh letter this time, to Punjab National Bank. In this letter, he has offered what he claims is a concrete repayment plan. So that's as far as what uh, Nirav Modi is planning. But uh, Kritika, with uh, Punjab National Bank's backs against the wall, they're trying everything. Now they're trying to sell some distressed assets. Around they have to. After being hit with the massive fraud, the cash stock Punjab National Bank is stepping up its recovery efforts. And we, in fact, exclusively learned that the bank has invited expression of interest to acquire majority stake in the debt-laden in Bharat Thermal Power Limited. Ritu Singh is back with us with exclusive details. Ritu, PNB is leading the lenders consortium. What are you picking up with respect to how this sale will pan out? That's right, there's tremendous pressure on the banking industry to ensure that some of the cases that were under restructuring are implemented because failing which all of these SDR S4A schemes will become non-performing assets as soon as the new RBI guidelines on NPA resolution kicks in. And one of these cases is in Bharat Thermal uh, Power Plant Limited, uh, which is one such case where Punjab National Bank is the lead and is leading the recovery efforts and it has appointed a banker, uh, its own investment arm, to find a suitor to buy 100% stake in the company and take complete management control. We understand that the reserve price of the asset has been set at 823 crore rupees, that is for In Bharat Thermal Power Limited, uh, although the debt of the company is over well over 1000 crore rupees, but that is a settlement value uh, that PNB is looking at. There is a consortium of 18 lenders, you know, there's Bank of India, State Bank of India, Canada, Vijaya Bank, Yuko Bank, several other lenders that are involved, but the largest uh, chunk uh, is with Punjab National Bank. We also understand that the thermal power plant is operational and has a 300 megawatt capacity uh, in the state of Tamil Nadu and PNB is hopeful uh, that by the, uh, the second week of March EOIs will come in. Well, desperate times calls for desperate measures. Ritu Singh, many thanks for joining in with those important details. Meanwhile, the government has now decided to close down as many as 35 international branches of public sector banks. Remember, last year, North Block had asked public sector banks to look at rationalizing their domestic and overseas branches in an effort to boost their financials. Sapna Das, who in fact broke that story earlier today, joins in with the very latest. So, Sapna, help us understand why were these branches shut down? And also, do we expect more foreign public sector bank branches to be shut down in the coming days? What are your sources telling you? As for the ongoing reform the agenda for the public sector banks, uh, the government has clearly said that uh, out of the 215 odd international operations of public sector banks, including the branches, basically 35 of them are uh, due for closure, uh, and this process is on right now. In the second phase, uh, they are also looking at 68 to 69 further international operations, and these would comprise international branches, remittance offices, representative offices, uh, subsidiaries, joint ventures so all of these are also on the radar in terms of further consolidation or rationalization uh, the third aspect of course but uh, government is also clearly indicating that this does not mean that in a particular geographical location there will be no international branch uh, or a representative office of any of the particular banks but it's just that there will not be any more overlapping of branches so it's also a rationalization exercise it's a consolidation exercise and uh, uh, you know uh, this is going to continue for quite some time interest Interestingly, there is already a panel of uh, the top banks uh, which have come out with these kind of recommendations and the government is now going ahead with the same. Okay, that's a very important move, Savna. Thanks for breaking that up for us. But speaking on this very move to shut down international branches, Rajneesh Kumar, the chairman of State Bank of India, has said that this shouldn't be linked to the Nirav Modi fraud case and that the rationalization of branches was essentially to bring down the operational costs. Here's what he had to say earlier today. I think uh, it should not be dealing uh, with the LOU or uh, Nirav Modi case, but this rationalization of branches, whether overseas or domestically, that has been on the agenda of the government. Yeah. And uh, we had this uh, exercise done at the time of Manthan, 
that banks uh, need to bring down operational costs. Regulatory uh, requirements across the world, they are increasing. So unless the business volume justifies existence of an office, uh, we have to rationalize and there is no choice. All right, let's now get you the latest in the Karthi Chidambaram case. A day after his dramatic arrest at the Chennai airport, Karthi Chidambaram, the accused in the INX media case, has now been sent to CBI custody till the 6th of March. Karthi Chidambaram was arrested by CBI at the Chennai airport on Tuesday when he returned from London. He was remanded to one-day custody of the CBI. Karthi had called his arrest a political vendetta. His father and former finance minister, Mr. P. Chidambaram, quickly issued a statement accusing the government of using the CBI and other agencies to target his family. And that kicked off a war of words between the BJP and other parties. Now, with Karthi Chidambaram sent to five-day custody, what's the next course of action? My colleague Ashmit Kumar spoke with Sanjay Jha of Congress Party and Narendra Taneja of the BJP to get their views on the same. Take a look. Mr. Taneja, to you first, the charge that is being leveled is that this is political vendetta. The charge that the Congress is leveling and one imagines with a certain degree of responsibility, given that they've stated this in the court as well, is that this is designed to take the sheen off, to take the edge off the media coverage as far as the Nirav Modi case, the Modi case is concerned. That is one thing that is in fact causing some concern. Your thoughts, your reactions to that charge that is being leveled on the timing of this arrest? Well, I think this is, uh, you know, uh, nothing to do as far as BJP is concerned or the government is concerned. It's a case which has been going on for quite some time and here the law is taking its own course. And I think some political parties, particularly the Congress party, they are trying to politicize it. They are questioning so many things. They are questioning the integrity of the CBI. They are questioning the mental health of Indrani Mukherjee, who is a, you know, uh, who is a witness in the whole thing. And they are questioning so many other things. I mean, they can do it. I mean, they are frustrated every day. They build new narrative. They by now they have built at least one million narratives against against the government, against the BJP, and so on and so forth. Allow me to interject. While you do say that this is a narrative being built by the Congress, you cannot take away from the fact that as far as the grounds for the CBI is concerned, it has been non-cooperation. But we have Karthi Chidambaram responding to both the summons of the CBI, responding to both the summons of the ED. Uh, in fact, he was arrested, ironically, while he was flying back into the country. So clearly not a flight risk. That does raise the question as to the timing and the nature of this action. Isn't that something that deserves a response from the BJP? You see, the first of all, let me say, you see, the point is the BJP or the government has nothing to do with it. There's the central agency called CBI, which is actually carrying out the investigation under the Constitution's Article 21, as we all know that. The question is that, you know, that if you look, if you ask your reporter in Delhi, what happened today in the, what happened during the past 24 hours? You see, first, uh, Karthi Chidamaram, he said, got uh, uh, pain in the chest. So he kind of asked for the doctor, then in the morning he got up late, so he didn't answer any, any question. Any any question that CBI, for Fair instance, enough. tried Fair to ask point. the past 24 hours. Fair and enough. that's one of the reasons, that's one of the reasons that, you know, now he has been uh, given Let another... Me, Mr. Tineja, allow me to take that up. If you have nothing to hide, then be open about it. No, if you have nothing to hide, be open and transparent. Let me take that up with Mr. Sanjay Jha. Why Congress is politicizing unnecessarily. Let me take that up with Mr. Sanjay Jha. Mr. Jha, that is, in fact, uh, uh, I was in the courtroom. I did see, in fact, the CBI make that submission that he was admitted to the hospital. Mr. Jha, uh, the concern being raised here is that there has been non-cooperation. And let's keep in mind that high court conditions necessarily haven't been complied with in terms of uh, a detailed itinerary and undertaking before the CBI. Uh, but that aside, even with the one day's police custody that uh, Karthi Chidambaram had been assigned, well, uh, he was admitted into the hospital and no questioning was done. Uh, again, raising the question of has he been evasive, at least that's the position that the CBI is putting across before the court, that Karthi Chidambaram simply has been evasive, has been non-cooperative. Your response? No, I'll keep my response brief. Uh, this is a brazen case of uh, political reprisal. Uh, let me tell you, even as we talk, the aggregate value of the scams of all Nirav Madhu, Mehul Choksi, Jatin Mehta has by today risen to over rupees 39,000 crores. So clearly, Mr. Modi's government, which has a lot to answer to the people of India, is looking for the usual diversionary strategy. This is the way this government operates. Now, let's come down to the fundamental point of this case. Number one, as far as this case is concerned, Mr. Chidamnam today said it in the courts. He's even said it in parliament before that he is the one who initiated the entire inquiry 
into the INX media case. It was done mm. by Mr. Chidambaram himself when he was the finance minister. Uh, you'll be aware that the serious fraud office indicted the INX media when the UPA was in government in November of 2013 with Mr. Mm -hmm. Chidambaram at the helm of affairs. So this is an absurd and an atrocious mm -hmm. charge and I can get into the details. Mr. Tanija, let me also just add to that by asking you uh, that as far as this entire case is concerned, best case scenario for the CBI, Karthi Chidambaram stands convicted, of course, assuming uh, that he stands convicted of being a middleman. That still raises a big, big question mark as far as the involvement of the FIPB officials are concerned. Let's also keep in mind that none of those FIPB officials are mentioned as a part of the FIR. Hence raising the question, why just go after the middleman? And if there is genuinely an issue here with the ex post facto clearance, why not target the functionaries here? Why not target the FIPB officials? <laughs> that is something that the Congress is pointing out as exactly. perhaps a sign of this being exactly. vindictive politics as Karthi Chidamram being targeted. It's not only Karthi Chidamram, there are eight other persons involved in that and FIR is also against them. It's not only Karthi Chidamram, but Congress has yes, singled out FIPB Karthi Chidamram for the to be reasons mentioned. we all know. The point Mr. is... Mr. Taneja, the FIPB officials no, are no, nowhere that, to be mentioned. See, they are not in the loop of inquiry. Now, let me answer it. Let, let me answer it. You see, who should be mentioned, who should not be mentioned? That is for the CBI to decide. They must have done their homework. They must have done their homework and they must have decided who should be mentioned and who should not be mentioned. I am I'm, I'm not a CBI spokesperson. You should ask this question to CBI. But what we know for sure is why Karthi Chidambaram is not cooperating. And CBI says today, since you were in the court, I have only read in the media, they are saying that, you know, there is a shocking evidence that he went abroad and he closed the accounts. That's CBI is saying to the Fair court. Enough. Imagine to the court, if we Fair say enough. we have no respect for court, no respect for the law, it's a Fair different enough. story. But I, all I'm saying is, is, is everything is, is going in accordance with the law. Respect the law, don't politicize it. Okay, respect the law, but don't politicize it. We will, of course, be tracking the story very closely over the course of the next few days. But quick break, when we return, a special discussion with Rajiv Nath of Association of Indian Medical Device Industry on government's decision to bring imaging equipment under the purview of Drugs Act. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back. The government is now all set to ensure stronger regulations for ultrasound and imaging equipment. It will now be brought under the Drugs and Cosmetics Act. What does this mean? The government will now, will now be able to regulate import, manufacturing and sales of these equipments. The move, we are told, is aimed at monitoring quality and avoiding use of these machines for sex selection. Archana Shukla caught up with Rajiv Nath, the forum coordinator at the Association of Indian Medical Device Industry. And she started off by asking him about the market size of these imaging and endoscopic machines. Medical imaging is a very vast field uh, which covers ultrasound, X-ray, uh, CT scan, MRI, endoscopes, uh, linear accelerators. So we estimate the market size to be about uh, over 15,000 crore rupees. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, in your assessment, what, uh, uh, you know, what percentage of this market was actually unregulated and unregistered till now that the government is trying to bring under regulation? Well, the market uh, basically have got two kinds of imaging. One is uh, based on radiation and one is non-radiation. So the ones under radiation are already being regulated uh, through AERB, uh, the Atomic uh, Energy Regulatory Board. And uh, now the government is trying to regulate uh, all of these uh, from the point of view of not only radiation, but from the point of view of uh, patient safety uh, under the uh, Drug and Cosmetics Act. Right, you uh, know. That's what's been passed. And uh, uh, the whole industry from the point of view of uh, the patient safety is completely unregulated as of today's date. Right. You know, the, the prime 100%. reason behind this regulation is to avoid use of ultrasounds and CT scanner machines for sex selection. Uh, you know, and we are a sex skewed nation, so to say. Uh, but how effective do you think these regulations would be uh, in the current scenario? Well, the Drugs and Cosmetics Act is designed from the point of view of uh, uh, seeing that patients are not harmed. So it's mainly patient safety that's a purview. In terms of uh, placement, sales, excess, uh, there would be challenges which uh, the government would have to definitely address, for which the current system is not really designed for. Mm -hmm. 
uh, you know, a lot of ultrasound machines are now mobile, uh, you know, uh, are very mobile, are very small in size. Uh, would this, you know, I'm just trying to understand, would this regulation be really helpful? It's a good move, certainly, by the government. But will it really be helpful in uh, curtailing the use of these equipments for uh, uh, said purposes of sex selection and others? Well, of course, when you put a social cost like that, something has to be done to address that. And uh, this is one way forward trying to achieve that. It may not be the best way, uh, but something better than nothing, I, I guess. Okay. So, uh, and still the government, of course, has to address the issue of uh, the parallel imports which come in of uh, pre-owned equipment, which is uh, uh, also coming in substantially. Nearly 30% of the value of the goods coming in uh, currently are pre-owned second-hand goods coming in. So uh, regulations will definitely help to uh, curb that, restrict that. And uh, once uh, there is uh, a control over the warehousing, the sales, uh, uh, the resales, the servicing, I guess uh, some kind of, uh, uh, of that objective will be achieved. May not be 100%, but maybe in the right direction. But a bigger concern for us is uh, not only this uh, issue of the social cause, for which it is being uh, uh, pursued, but uh, we've been demanding from the industry that we do need regulations, but of the right kind. Mm -hmm. uh, the in current that sense, uh, ERB regulations are very much skewed. Yeah, uh, yeah. From the point of view of imports, you've got. Uh, sorry, please go ahead. No, no, go ahead, go ahead. Yes. So the current uh, ERB regulations uh, give uh, import clearances for imports in about a month's time, whereas an uh, Indian manufacturer has to take nearly about a year's time to get himself uh, currently registered through an ARB uh, regulatory process. And uh, the, the DNC Act has now, of course, the, the medical device rules which can be used to regulate. But these are still very new in infancy and uh, the process and the systems are still uh, being unfolded. And uh, maybe the medical device uh, uh, act uh, would be the better position for doing all this but since that is not even a bill that has been labeled uh, tabled to the parliament, uh, we have been recommending to the government uh, to cover such medical electronics and devices under the BIS rules, uh, whereby uh, the quality, quality management systems of these companies uh, could be certified by accredited uh, certification bodies. Okay, and the accreditation okay. is given by NABCB. Uh, uh, all right, all right. Just as a last question, sir, uh, you know, uh, a drug, uh, we still are a little way away from the Medical Devices Act, so to say, and you're saying uh, the Drugs and Cosmetics Act is not really the best uh, model, uh, but even here, item by item, the government is increasing regulation. What are the other segments uh, of medical devices that you feel uh, would be coming under regulation right now, now uh, uh, going forward? Well, in medical electronics alone, we've given a list of about 32 items for the government to consider. Uh, you've got the high-risk items mm. uh, like pacemakers, uh, ultrasound machines is only uh, one part of it, but you've got uh, heart-lung machines, infusion pumps, uh, you've got consumer goods, uh, whether it is a, a glucometer or a thermometer, none of this is regulated. Mm. So uh, it's a large basket and nearly 90% of the goods which are coming to the country hmm. are coming in into an environment which is totally unregulated and that's very much uh, scary because uh, you have okay. no calibration hmm. for such uh, medical electronic goods coming into the country. All right, let's move on to the other big story from the healthcare space. Fortis Healthcare reported a loss for their second and third quarter earnings late last night. Remember, the company is currently battling issues of litigation and reduction in promoter stake. The company tried elevating some concerns over a conference call. Ekta Batra, who has been tracking these developments very closely, is here with the details. Ekta, firstly, what are the key takeaways from Fortis conference call and what exactly was the assurance that was given by the company to investors? Well, some important takeaways which came in from the uh, Fortis investor call that they held after the numbers were released last night. So, for example, the company has mentioned that they have initiated an invest investigation going on with regards to the related party transaction issue and there is already a SEBI investigation going on with this particular case. Remember, that was already qualified in the notes to accounts in yesterday's press release as well. The loan, according to them, uh, which is basically this in related party transaction loan of over 470-odd crores, should be fully paid by end of Q1 FY18. Separately, 
Fortis did mention that they have some challenges with banks due to promoter linkages and in terms of uh, the kind of loans, though they've never defaulted on any loans ever. Um, separately, they said that they do not believe that Fortis needs to go to court when it comes to any sort of fundraising, so no real connection according to them with regards to the Daichi arbitration. The auditors have signed off on the report which was released for the Q2 and Q3 numbers, but they have pointed on three items in the audit report as per the Fortis management. Nothing is finalized when it comes to the fundraising for uh, funding the RHT transaction, so that's an important point to note. And lastly, the SR the merger plans could change in case there is an investor that comes in finally uh, for Fortis. Wow, no end to Fortis' woes there, Ekta. Many thanks for getting us those details. More from the pharma space now, and this is an exclusive. The phase of uncertainty surrounding CIPLA is over. Those words coming from the CEO, Umang Bora. He caught up with Archana Shukla. Bora said that the pharma giant is always on the prowl for acquisitions. He also asserted that CIPLA is in the market to only buy and no part of CIPLA is on sale. You know, now in terms of assessment uh, for growing your scale in, in the U.S., uh, would you look at more acquisitions? There are more, uh, you know, uh, global assets that are coming on the block right now. Sandoz has, you know, spoken. There are some more assets that Teva could uh, hive off. Uh, would you still be in the market for looking? And if you are already looking at something? We will always look. Um, but if you were to ask me whether our capital allocation would be more towards generic and that ticks the one, I think U.S. generics less. Uh, emerging market generics, which are deep market pools like China and Brazil, mm -hmm. yes, we tick that box. Specialty, as a new area, whether we'd, act, whether we'd spend more money into specialty, for sure, yes. Would there be some, uh, you know, assets within CIPLA that you would want to divest? Would that also be on the mind when you're looking at charting this, you know, the consolidation of your business, um, when you have looked at divesting a few of your emerging markets assets? Does India feature somewhere? Is there something that you think doesn't work? Uh, for CIPLA. In CIPLA, uh, which you would... So, yeah, so I think we've done quite a few. We've done our VET business, we divested that, uh, and a couple of these portfolios in other countries, you know, Croatia, etc. We've sold all of that. So all that's done. Uh, would we like to divest any part of our business? Not sure. Uh, if we do a really huge deal in CIPLA that transforms CIPLA for the, f for the future, and the likelihood of that is low, could we use one of our businesses as, uh, you know, a, as a means of raising some amount of cash? For example, could we think of our India business or our South Africa business in a different manner, right? Yes, but we will never sell them. Okay. So we'll never be sellers for any of our businesses. Hmm. We might use them to bring in capital, but never to sell them. Hmm. But I don't think it's going to be the core markets. I, at this point in time, CIPLA in no part is up for sale, right? So CIPLA's done away with what it needed to and right now it's in the mood to consolidate and buy more and buy more in the u.s market also in the u.s specialty side yes well that's a very important clarification coming in from cipla cipla is not looking at a sale they are in fact in the market to buy more we will take a very short break on that note but up next auto companies witness strong sales across categories in february has demand revival already begun we'll get you all the numbers on the other side don't go anywhere Back now, ahead of the long weekend, markets took a breather with cash volumes on the lower end, but banks let a sharp fall in the last hour, so the Nifty traded almost flat until 2.30 p.m. until a sharp fall dragged it lower by three-tenths of a percent. The Sensex ended just above the 34,000 mark. Bank Nifty, though, fell more than 200 points, while mid-caps ended with cuts of about four-fifths of a percent. It's the first day of the month and we have the auto sales numbers for the month of February. And what a remarkable month this has been. It was a strong month with practically all the companies seeing robust numbers. Let's get you the numbers now, starting with Ashok Leyland. The company beat what the street was expecting with total sales volume rising close to 30%. Meanwhile, Maruti sold 4,000 cars more this month as compared to the same last year. Overall, a growth of about 14%. Escort's dream run continues with the company seeing a 50% rise in their overall tractor volumes. Another great month there for Aisha. 
as uh, coming in and they too witnessed a quarter percent jump in their overall Royal Enfield volumes. What about Mahindra and Mahindra? We saw their sales rising a healthy 19 percent during the month of February. Meanwhile, exports have also picked up for Bajaj Auto. The company saw its three-wheeler sales spike over 100 percent, almost doubling from what it was last month. The only dampener was Tata Motors. The company sold fewer cars as compared to what the poll was expecting, but 34 percent higher than what they had done last year. Well, from auto to aviation, then a Kappa India report suggests that Abu Dhabi-based Etihad Airways may part ways with India's Jet Airways. A tweet from Kappa India's handle says, and I quote now, Kappa research indicates that Etihad may divest its 24% stake in Jet Airways, possibly by the third quarter of FY19. Now, this could lead to a rationalization of capacity between India and the Gulf, particularly Abu Dhabi, end quote. However, Etihad on its part has denied the report and has told CNBC TV18 that it won't be exiting Clarifications there, but we have much more from the aviation space because sources are now telling us that the aviation ministry has prepared a draft expression of interest or an EOI for Air India stake sale. A group of ministers led by finance minister will be meeting next week to finalize the contours of this EOI. Among the suggestions in the document is protection for existing employees post the divestment as well as options to retain and offload the government stake which sources say the government is very keen on. Well, we will have to slip into a very, very tiny break, though. But on the other side, uh, no Tamil or Telugu movies in the foreseeable future. Why? We will tell you on the other side. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back. The Tamil Film Producers Council has called an indefinite strike starting tomorrow. The strike is in protest against the virtual print fee or the VPF, which is charged by digital distribution companies. The VPF is essentially a subsidy which is paid by a film distributor to digital distribution companies. Jude Sanit is joining us with all the details. So, Jude, tell us, what are the film producers saying? Well, like you rightly pointed out, the bone of contention really is the virtual print fee or the VPF. Uh, the, Tamil, the producers, remember, it's not just the Tamil Film Producers. The Tamil Film Producer Council has taken an active stance, but it also includes producer councils across the states of Kerala, Karnataka, Andhra Pradesh and Telangana, who have all decided to go on strike starting tomorrow. Now, the problem really is that VPF for a regional language film, which pretty much means films that are released across these states, stands at 22,500 rupees per film per screen. Now, film producers tell us that this is way too much. It totals to around 27 lakh rupees for 100 screens for, 100 screens for every new film release. Essentially, this fee, producers say, needs to be banned simply because films today are being screened in a digital age and will not, producers say, warrant this much of a charge. Now, in their defense, film distribution companies, much like Cube Cinemas, remember, who account for close to 1,800 screens across South India, are stating that as it is 22,500 rupees is a highly subsidized rate that these producers are paying for the release of a film because let's remember a Hollywood film pays close to $850 which is close to 60,000 rupees so essentially a regional film pays just one third of that cost and no abolishment no abolition of these charges can be expected at the moment since it is already subsidized as a result of this most Tamil films who of course you know are coming out of the Tamil Film Producers Association will not be playing out in anywhere across the country starting tomorrow. There are exceptions, but that is, of course, in a minority like a film called Dharavi that's scheduled for release tomorrow, but the majority of the films will not release tomorrow. And even as multiplexes across Telangana and Andhra Pradesh will remain shut indefinitely, even as multiplexes in Kerala and Karnataka, where film producer associations don't exercise as much clout, will remain shut as a way of token protest for just one day. So a standstill for South Indian film releases across varying levels in the south of India. Back to you. Okay, Joe, thanks for taking us through that. But let's revisit the big story from the aviation sector. A Kappa India report suggests that Abu Dhabi-based Etihad Airways may part ways with India's Jet Airways. However, Etihad has denied the report. Kapil Call of Kappa is with us on the phone line. Kapil, Etihad has sent us a statement saying that they will remain invested with Jet. Help us understand the genesis of this research on Etihad actually exiting their entire stake in the company. So, uh, good evening, sir. We continuously evaluate at CAPA, we continuously evaluate strategic issues with mm. almost every stakeholder. And during our assessment, which we do on a quarterly basis, 
uh, understanding of strategic issues and priorities of all stakeholders, including their partners, is assessed. Our understanding is that the post, the relationship with respect to the Delta KLM, um, the partnership uh, with, with Etihad, the rules and, and, and the game for the partnership with, with Etihad no longer seems to be relevant because they're mm. competing with each other. And subsequently, the demand challenges that you see on Middle East, both in terms of volumes and yields, is the other play uh, with respect to Jet Airways. So our understanding is that in FI-19, um, yeah. the the, the uh, divestment will happen. Obviously, the divestment will have many uh, pivots around it, especially related to valuation. Hmm. But broadly, the strategy of Etihad, which was initiated by the previous CEO, was not relevant. It just created a major hole in, 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 in yeah. Etihad. Yeah. They are divesting from all the bad decisions that were taken. Hmm. We expect that over a period of next fiscal, the logical conclusion will be move away from uh, Jet Airways. So, 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 Kapil, your assessment is that uh, uh, KLM and Delta, given their uh, partnership at this point in time, would be a preferred uh, investor than Etihad and would make more sense for Jet than Etihad? Obviously, our, this is not now for the last couple of uh, yeah. last year and a half. In our outlook, we normally see Delta as a partner uh, for, for uh, Jet Airways. Obviously, after the Jet Airways um, uh, KLM partnership, both on the European and the North, North American markets, the Etihad and the Jet network complete conflicts with each other. But that was the basic tenet of the Jet Etihad agreement that most of the North American and U U.S. operation, except the Canadian flights, because of the bilaterals, would would most, mostly move away from Etihad. The ground rules for the partnership are no longer relevant now. It is a matter of time when Etihad seeks. Uh, that does the divestment. Obviously, as I said, the rules of the game would include valuation and other strategic issues because they have invested in the frequent flyer program. They have $150 million for slots. They have uh, provided guarantees for ECB. So it will it will be over a period of time when the process of divestment happens. We believe that in Q3 it will happen. Uh, All right. But the, the, the basic question... Okay, Kapil, then, just that... quickly, Kapil, we're running out of time. Yeah, Kapil, mm -hmm. just one quick question. Sorry, good evening, Ranujay here. One last question yes. then, Kapil. You know, why this was a bit surprising is because unlike Etihad's previous two investments, Jet seemed to be a much better uh, sort of investment going by the returns. So, therefore, one was a bit surprised by this. But going by that, let's just say if Etihad were to exit Jet Airways, do you think, considering the fact that at this point in time, you know, they've been laying off their pilots or at least, uh, you know, asking them to go on uh, leave without pay, the, the airline has been facing some sort of financial headwind. Do you think they at all will be interested in a similar sort of arrangement with whether, whether an Indian airline or with an overseas airline? Do you think they have the financial muscle to do that? Well, I think uh, in the near term, whether it is an FI 19 or 20, recapitalization of jet is critical. I think they need to get in funds. Uh, and I think over uh, over the next 12 to 18 months, logical would be that you would see funds coming from Delta once this partnership develops. Etihad, in terms of the business plan that Jet, Jet is developing, no, no longer seems relevant. And I keep repeating that more than Jet wanting uh, new strategic partners, Etihad is cleaning up their act. They had a, a, a strategy which has which created a massive uh, sort of a financial hole all their investments have gone 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 bust. Yeah. Uh, the jet, whatever is left of jet, I think they want to mas massively grow organically rather than keep divested, keep invested in partners. Uh, so my sense would be that it is a matter of time that uh, the jet would, uh, the mm -hmm. Etihad divestment will happen. We see that happening within this year. It okay. may happen even before. But obviously we don't expect Etihad to come out and say that they're divesting till this happens. Uh, there are other uh, possible reasons to it. No, but that, that's Etihad, true, Kapil. Etihad's strategy to buy out defunct mm -hmm. companies and try to make it work has, has failed. It has created a, a major sort of a hole, yeah. a big, big uh, colossal loss. And the only exception is Jet, but it doesn't. The fitment from a, from a strategic perspective is no yeah. longer there. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, you can't expect them to confirm that it is happening before it happens. But uh, a couple of times for taking us through that analysis. Uh, but we are completely out of time on this edition of India Business Hour. Many thanks for watching the show. From Ron, me and the entire team of India Business Hour, good night and thanks for watching. Have a lovely long weekend.